Mike Frieda Northaven's first selectman, and welcome to our show today. Today's show focuses in on substance abuse, the early warning signs. Wherever I go here in North Haven, dealing with other chief elected officials, what we find is that there's a problem that's becoming very pervasive in our communities today, even in the suburbs, and that is a high instance of substance abuse. North Haven over the past three or four years has had a substance abuse council that's been in place. This council is comprised of members of our public safety, police and fire, myself, my executive assistant Valerie Goodkin, business leaders in the community, and also concerned parents. One of our missions is to create awareness, education, and prevention to really help people who may be experiencing this insidious problem. My guest today are Mary Marcuccio, the president, uh, CEO, and founder of My Bottom Line, and Mrs. Joanne Hoffman, who is a concerned parent who has been a strong advocate for substance abuse prevention, education, and, and prevention, and awareness here in North Haven for quite some time. So I'd like to start with Mary. Mary, can you tell us a little bit about My Bottom Line and some of the work you've done? Thank you, Mike. My Bottom Line is my consul a consulting company that has two pieces. I work directly with families who have a child with substance abuse. And we also have the community-based part, which is a support group. We happen to have our meetings now in North Haven. We have them once a month. And any family who feels as though they're having substance abuse issues with their child can come to that. We focus primarily on opiates, which would be like the prescription pills and heroin. Those tend to be the two biggest. And if a parent is having a concern or having a problem or is already in an established pattern of drug use and they're looking for support and resources, they can call me and or they can come to the monthly meetings. Good. And Mary, you've been, this work that you've done, you've been doing this for quite some time now. When did it actually start for you? When did you form this organization? Um, my bottom line came from another nonprofit that I ran. So altogether about seven years I've had the business. And on a personal level, the reason I started this is because I have a son who's drug involved. Um, it's been a heartache for us since he was probably, I want to say, 11, 12 years old. He's now in his uh, mid-20s, 25. And um, the hardest part for us was the fact that we couldn't find resources. We didn't get all of the um, education that I felt we, we could have gotten. So when uh, some things happened in our life and there were some changes in our circumstances, I started speaking out. I, live in, I lived in Southington and um, started speaking out about the drug problem and trying to create awareness. Also to create a support group, which was something that we couldn't find back in the teen years we were looking for. And that's really what my bottom line does, is it addresses that young drug user, although there's no age per se, but primarily it came from the experience of the fact that we had this in our life and we had experience, my husband and I was dealing with this, and we wanted to help other families maybe not have to go through quite as much as we had. And I know that you've been uh, working very closely with us in North Haven. You've actually uh, spoken in front of uh, groups. You're actually doing an event. I believe even tonight you're going to be here. So we really appreciate you helping us create awareness to this problem here in North Haven. Well, Mike, let me say I appreciate that. But at the same time, I want you to know, and I, we've had some obviously some candid conversations. I work with uh, communities all over the country. So not just here in Connecticut, but all over the country. And I can honestly say that North Haven has a very proactive number one starts with you, <laughs> uh, philosophy. And that is what is going to make a difference because we have a number of families from North Haven in our group. And I've been asked this recently by a reporter, within the state of Connecticut, which towns do you have the greatest response from? And I can honestly say North Haven is on the top of that list. Well, thank you. You know, we see a myriad of problems here. And substance abuse is manifested into many different forms. Uh, here in North Haven and, and really other communities. And we see it in, in the form of tobacco abuse. Uh, there is, of course, alcohol abuse. And we have, as part of our council, I mentioned uh, some of the components, but we've also uh, have, has had, as part of our council, uh, mothers of drunk driving, representatives from our uh, Tobacco Institute, to talk about how tobacco, as an example, could lead to even more insidious temptations. And we have also members of the clergy here in North Haven as part of the Substance Abuse Council. And this wide variety of resources, I really believe working with people like Mary, working with concerned parents like Joanne, have really helped us raise the awareness. And our goal, ladies and gentlemen, is this, very simply. If we could save one life here in North Haven, 
then we think that we've accomplished something. Our goal would be to really create the awareness even more so and really help as many people as we possibly can. But in the end, if we can save one life, that would be very successful for us. And, and we've had, we have seen some problems here in town. So I'd like to thank you, Mary, for being here, and Joanne. And I wanted to ask you, I have some questions. And uh, the first question I'd like to ask is, what are some of the early signs or red flags that you would see Joanne, in terms of uh, being a parent, what is out there that parents should look for? I think one of the first things that we observed going through this personally was um, we were, my daughter was sort of isolated from, from us. She separated herself. She was no longer participating in family things. She was very much alone. Her behavior changed. She didn't hang out with the same people, um, lost tons of weight. Um, just really wasn't uh, wasn't wasn't our wasn't our daughter anymore, mm -hmm. and we just at the time we just really thought it was something that kids were going through that it was a phase that she was going through, mm -hmm. and uh, we soon came to learn that it wasn't. You've done a great job, Joanne, working with us here in town and creating this level of awareness. And you know we've seen so many other signs. You know, parents have come to us and have said that uh, their child may have looked. Uh, as if they hadn't slept in days. Um, another sign that we've heard is that, you know, if a child, as an example, does not shower or bathe for an extended period of time, or the excuses at night, I have to go out get gasoline, mm -hmm. I need cigarettes, I have to go out. These repeated instances of children leaving the home, telling their parents that they have somewhere to go, is also another early warning sign that we've heard parents uh, come to us and have uh, described to us. So there are many, many signs uh, that are key indicators as we, as we call them. Mary, I'd like to ask you, uh, what would you say to a parent who says, not my child, as an example? Well, I think we can kind of incorporate actually the, the previous question as well, and that is that Joanne is an example, I'm an example of a parent who has a child that had been involved in drugs. Um, you never see it coming, you don't think it could ever be me. And that's really one of the big things, I think, is that there is no such thing as a not-my-child parent because there are I was one of those parents. Wonderful, smart, intelligent, hardworking kids, doing well in school, athletes who end mm -hmm. up getting involved in substance abuse, whether it's alcohol or drugs. And as a parent, it's very hard for you to even conceive of that. We tend to have this picture in our head of what the troubled child looks like. And we're here today to show you what that is, why that is a fallacy. And that is that it can be, Mrs. Smith was watching, she can be me. She can be Joanne. Because her smart, good kid can make a very poor choice at any point in time and head down a path. And just to be specific about that, my daughter was in all AP classes. She played sports. She worked a part-time job. She did very well. I, I, wouldn't, I was the first one to say, no way, not my child. And if I could just go back, Mike, I wanted to add a few points yes. about some of the things to watch for, because Joanne and I have talked this yes. to death, and we have it on our website as well, some of the things that the average person, the average mom and dad, if you, my, my first suggestion is, if you think or feel something's wrong, it is. Mm -hmm. Listen to your gut, okay? You know this child. You've lived with this child. If your gut tells you something's wrong, it is. Okay, that's the first thing. The second thing is um, educate yourself. And that's really the biggest thing that I try to do with parents is, if we're talking, for example, about prescription pills, which is how most of the kids get into the higher level drugs, you're gonna watch for lethargic behavior, nodding off, pinpoint pupils, scratchy skin, kids are walking around like this kind of a thing. The things you mentioned, exactly, very good. Um, sleeping a lot, because unfortunately what happens is uh, uh, the uh, prescription pills and heroin are sedating. So they're gonna make you more tired, more relaxed. There's gonna be a lot of sleeping. Okay, so these are things that again, it, it's hard to differentiate for a lot of parents because if you have a teenager, teenagers are typically very tired and contrary, <laughs> lethargic, and may not get out of bed at time for an appointment. So you really kind of have to educate yourself, and that's what we're here for is to provide those resources. You know, it's very interesting, ladies and gentlemen, who are watching here on NHTV and Joanne and Mary, that about three months ago, we had a call in my office. And it was a parent who was one of those parents who in the past said, not my child. And the parent called because the parent was really searching for help, mm -hmm. very emotional. And we didn't realize as the call came in until we were told a little bit later on during the call 
that the parent expected a fight with us. The fight meaning that, no, not in North Haven, there's no problems in North Haven. And the parent was pleasantly surprised that we have these resources, that we have this Substance Abuse Council, that we have mechanisms and measures to help people in need. And Mary ended up becoming a very valuable resource for this one parent who came to us with a problem, who had no, no hope in terms of what this person could have done for her child. And now, this person is a concerned parent and this person is on our Substance Abuse Council, mm -hmm. helping us try to make inroads and strides. Mary. And I am so glad you brought that up because I, I remember that parent very well and we're working together and uh, the, her very words to me when we spoke were just that. She said, I assumed that when I called any town office, I was gonna, gonna get moved around in circles and told we don't really do that or what have you. And, and my answer to her was what I said earlier and that is that you're lucky to be in North Haven. Oh, thank you. So Mary, let's go to another question here. Is it possible for a teen or a young adult to be using opiates without a parent or guardian, or guardian seeing the signs, especially one who may be getting good grades and may be on track for college, as Joanne just mentioned? Me. Yes. <laughs> You're yes. describing my life. We had probably two years worth of red flags in our home on a daily basis. Had no clue. Not a clue. We were, uh, my husband and I, uh, of a mindset that we thought we were educated enough to know what to watch for. We were watching for what we thought was in our community, the pot behavior, maybe trying to drink, that sort of a thing. Never prepared for the idea that, first of all, heroin is largely available. It's terribly cheap. It's easy to get. Had no clue what to watch for, and that most of the kids, of course, go from prescription drugs to heroin. So the answer is yes. And that's one of the reasons why I do what I do, is because if I can educate, if a handful of people are watching this today, they go out and share this information with their friends, coworkers, what have you, we may be able to educate parents so that we can cut the learning curve. That's my hope, is that when Mrs. Smith sees any one of the warning signs, for example, on our website, she may say, hmm, you know, I think that might be happening here. And instead of doing nothing, she picks up the phone and makes a phone call. That can make the difference between life and death. Because where you catch a drug addiction or a drug process has a lot to do with where it's going to go. The earlier you catch it, the better. You know, to that point, what we've seen in town, we've talked about this even at uh, other public meetings and other forums, is that the high incident of temptation for our children tends to really become crystallized, moving from the fifth grade to the sixth grade and the eighth grade to the ninth grade. And these are critical times for us as parents to watch our children during these, what we say are phase-in times, moving from one portion of their life into another. So the fifth and sixth grade transition and the eighth and ninth grade transition is critical. Mary, I, I agree 100%. If I can just say, I spoke recently with another school district. We had this conversation, um, how they're going to change the protocol in terms of education so that we're catching that first transition window, which is one set of substance abuse, typically speaking. When you're heading toward the high school, you're talking and going into that maybe ninth grade. It tends to be the higher level drugs oftentimes. And if you can catch the education there with families, Again, awareness and, and understanding. Um, more drug education, of course, with the kids in school. But I think it's essential to understand that there are these windows of time, and there are others, if, you know, when we talk again, there are these windows of time where you have a lot of ability to impact a child's decision and their behavior. Yeah, you have to educate them. Um, I just have to comment, uh, over the last couple of years, I've spoken to most of the eighth grade health classes and Marsha Brown's classes. And one of the questions I generally ask is, how many students do not know anybody drug involved? Do not know anybody. And a lot of times, nobody raises their hand. And I would say to them, really, you all know somebody that's involved with drugs in some way. Mm -hmm. And these are eighth graders that are affiliated with this. Mm -hmm. And I refer to that as the one away. The one away. It's always one away. If it's not you using, you know someone who is. Right. Or if it's not you buying, you know someone who can get it. Mm -hmm. okay. All right, let's move to another question then. Um, what advice would you give to parents who have a child that they suspect may be using drugs? Educate them. They ha they te teach them what the signs and si the si the red flags. Mm -hmm. Okay. The other thing Joanne and I have talked about in the past is she's one of the parents who said very clearly she had a feeling. 
she had a feeling she and her husband would talk about things weren't right, something seemed off. It was um, always funny because my husband would always say, well, this is what kids do, and I just knew that wasn't my kid. Exactly. So yeah. trust your gut. Try to get as much education, and Joanne is one of my best students. And in the beginning, she was Mrs. Doubtfire. She was, I, I, in quotes, she was Mrs. No, that can't be right. No, we can't be doing that. No, she would never, my daughter would never do that. We would talk about different protocols, different treatment options. We would talk about drug testing and things. And Joanne was wonderful in the sense that she asked really hard questions so that when she got the answers, she was ready to make change. Was, yeah. And that's what we need as parents who want to ask the hard questions, who aren't afraid, they want to ask the hard questions, and want to, want to help their child. And you have to make changes in order to do that. You know, it's interesting as we're talking about this, it goes back again to to the early warning signs and uh, another w uh, early warning sign is if there's a uh, behavior in your child that is a little bit different than what you've normally experienced uh, quick tempered more angry more short tempered and the family dynamics being adversely affected that's another sign of this tension that builds in the in the person that adversely affects the family dynamic we've seen that also I agree and I think Joanne you can put put in when I'm done honey I want you to add to that the the different drugs will have different side effects right. so depending on what your child is using you'll see different characteristics and different traits so one may be, make you very uh, sedated another m drug may make you very high and very um, very manic in behavior mm -hmm. so again that's the education it, the, the thing is to look back at I know this child and something doesn't seem right, right. listen to that yeah. mm. okay. Yep, different drugs do different things. Mm -hmm. Behavior from smoking marijuana versus smoking crack versus cocaine versus opiates. Mm -hmm. Different behaviors. Okay, let's move to another question. Uh, some parents may think that recreational drug use, as an example, is something that their teen may try. And some may even think that they know about kids who did drugs back when they were in school. And uh, they, those kids may, as an example, have turned out okay today in life. But what, in your opinion, is the difference with abusing prescription drugs like Oxycontin or Percocet? How do you see it? Um, if I could take that, Mike, I'd like to say this. I have parents call me all the time who will be my age. So I'm going to categorize it 40s to 60s. Let's call that the generation, okay? That generation has a, a default mindset, mm -hmm. which is I did blah, blah, blah. If my son does blah, 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 it'll be okay, like you say. Mm -hmm. I smoked pot in college, I'm fine. Mm -hmm. I drank, I'm okay. I got over it, I got past it. That's where the education comes in. The drugs that are available to our children today are phenomenally different than what was available to our generation. So it's availability. You and I couldn't get heroin if we tried when we were in high school. It simply didn't exist within our community base. It just was not an option. Today, heroin is the one away. It is the most common drug. It is the most readily processed within a community, trafficked. And it is the easiest to get. It's easier to get heroin in North Haven than pop. Parents need to understand that our drugs, our drugs are very different from the drugs that our kids are going to have. Then you also talk about um, the actual drug itself. Let's take marijuana for an example. The pot that our generation could have gotten their hands on had a very low THC count. The pot today that our kids get their hands on has a tremendously high THC account, which, which is, is the, the, act, the active ingredient, right? Yep. Which is a hallucinogenic piece. And you see episodes now where kids are actually having seizures, they're having psychotic breaks because of smoking pot. Mm -hmm. Something that never would have happened back in the generation that we're used to, that we're yes. talking about. Joanne? And that well, and then you're talking seizures and things like that. And then you have these mm -hmm. um, fake marijuanas like Spice and K2 that are out there now that is causing all sorts of uh, emergency room problems mm -hmm. with rapid heart rates, and uh, there's been deaths as a result of that. Mm -hmm. So it's okay. scary. Kids can get that. You can get that. At, you can get some scary things at local stores. All right. Let's move on to the next question. We have been seeing in the media more about this epidemic that's now at epidemic proportions of opiate abuse across the country. Why is heroin use becoming so prevalent around the country, in the suburbs, in the urban areas, and even now we've seen it in North Haven? Your opinion, please. If I could, I'd like you to add uh, your experience, okay. Joanne, and that is that I, I, um, if you look at the big picture of comparing, for example, suburban communities right. to urban, and you start looking at statistics and numbers, which is where I'm going to go with this, 
you're going to see that, statistically speaking, within the last 20 years, heroin has had a tremendous impact because of the direct relation to prescription pills. So what has happened is that our suburban kids have more money than their urban counterparts, for example. Mm -hmm. So they're able to afford a, an OxyContin that may be 20 milligrams, 40 milligrams, 80 milligrams, and it's about a dollar a milligram. So one of our suburban kids, typically who has a job, who may have funding from their parents, oftentimes we as parents in suburbia don't understand, but we tend to hand our 16-year-olds three things that are dangerous. We hand them a car, we hand them a credit card, and we hand them freedom. Mm -hmm. That's a recipe for disaster. So when you've got a kid who gets involved with the prescription pills, after a while they simply cannot maintain how much it costs. It can cost hundreds of dollars a day. They're going to graduate to heroin as a, as a natural process of that. And that's t typically where we've been in the Northeast for the last almost 15 years. Um, and if you look at the big picture, you see that the number one uh, opiate users in the Northeast and this is something most, most parents wouldn't even wrap their head around. The number one users of heroin in the Northeast are Caucasian males living in um, suburban and rural communities, 18 to 25 years old. So again, it goes back to the first part of our conversation about we have a picture in our head of what you know, maybe a drug user looks like. Well, the drug users are your child, my child, and her child. Joanne? If I could just add to that, you know, a lot of our kids are seeing their parents or their grandparents taking pills with, you know, they may have gone to the dentist or they may have um, a lot of pain. I work in the health field and a lot of patients are on a lot, a significant amount of opiates, painkillers, mm -hmm. and, you know, it's in, it's in so many people's um, medicine cabinets. Mm -hmm. um, my daughter got some pills from my medicine cabinet. It never occurred to me that the oxycodone I was taking for my back, you know, would be something that would bring her so much pleasure. So look in your medicine cabinets. Um, get those drugs out of there. Mm -hmm. Lock them up. To that point, Joanne, as you well know, uh, we have spearheaded in town for the last several years mm -hmm. this prescription drug uh, give back program that we do. And we have taken, ladies and gentlemen, hundreds of thousands of units out of the medicine cabinets of North Haven, Connecticut through this public awareness profile sketch that we have mapped out to the public. And it's very interesting because I've been there along with many of the people in the town to see the number of outdated pills, current prescription drugs that people are no longer using that we've taken out of the medicine cabinets. And a couple years ago we saw a very interesting statistic that cited that over 50% of young children who get hooked on drugs start with prescription drugs that are in the medicine cabinets of all of the homes in our respective communities. Absolutely. So that's another thing that we offer as part of our I substance agree 100%. abuse. Now let me ask you both this. If you had to give one piece of advice to the parents out there, what would it be? Mary, we'll start with you. Um, for me, it would probably be fr from the, my parents' heart. I speak as a mother, and that is that when you suspect something might be wrong, when you have that gut feeling, please don't do nothing. Right. Um, put, your, put your shame, put your embarrassment, um, put your fear of being in the newspaper, put your fear of, oh, God, the neighbors might find out. Put that in the closet. Make phone calls. Do research. Find out what you need to know about what's going on in your home. Mm -hmm. Because, and I speak from experience, you can't undo what you didn't do, number one. Number two, uh, when we're talking about opiates specifically, you're talking about life and death. And unfortunately, one of the greatest rates of death in the state of Connecticut is opiate overdose death. So all, pre all preventable. So education, I think, is key. Very good. Joanne? I would say not my kid. Mm -hmm. don't, don't, don't settle for that. Don't say that, not my kid. If I, if I said that, I don't know if my kid would be here today. Get education, get help. I am forever grateful to this woman. She saved my kid's life. She put us on the right path. Every time I said, no, Mary, that can't work. That's not my kid. No way. It would backfire. You have to educate yourself. That's a very powerful statement, Mary. True testimony to the resources that you mm -hmm. have to offer. One of our North Haven residents saying that you helped save her child's mm -hmm. life. Well. I am in a position where I can say there's two kind of parents that call me. There are parents that are um, ignorant because of uneducation, mm -hmm. lack of education. And there are parents that are in denial. Mm -hmm. 
um, I can help any parent who is uneducated. Um, because all the research in the world and all the information I can give them and resources that we can point them to is going to help them get the knowledge they have to have to make changes. If I have a parent in denial, you know, with the glasses on and the head down, um, I, I can't do anything with that. And it breaks my heart because I've had a number of those families um, come to me and unfortunately sometimes they do end up in a very bad situation. Um, but that's why Joanne is one of my favorite students because <laughs> she challenged me for a long, long time in the beginning, but good hard questions. Because she said, when I make a decision, I want to know that I'm making the right decision. I want to know what I'm doing. And that's, that's a good student. Well, as we come to a close here during this show, I want to let our residents know that this is going to be the first in a series of TV shows that we're going to be doing on North Haven TV. And these TV shows will help us create not only create more awareness in town, but also carefully illustrate, ladies and gentlemen, what we can do to help those parents who may have problems. Now, our goal is to help people. Our goal is to offer the resources where parents who suspect they may have problems can come to us and we can provide resources, such as Mary as an example, to help. Once again, substance abuse manifests itself in many different forms. Tobacco, alcohol, prescription drugs, opiate use. So we wanted you to know that during this public awareness initiative that we're taking on right now and through a series of TV shows that we will do that we are here for you in North Haven and for those parents who are out there that may need help you can feel free to call us in Town Hall and we will help you. So with that being said I'd like to thank you Joanne for being here today. Thank you for your work as one of our concerned parents and Mary we're absolutely okay. delighted to be working with you and thank you for everything you've done for the town of North Haven. Thank you.